Hello. I could talk about all the things I didn't do this week, that because that's mostly I did nothing relevant to this channel. I did a little bit of reading, and this is technically a reading update, so I guess I'll start with that. No, actually, I had found I was not really doing as much uh, my Spanish studying as I like to do normally, and I had to kind of reconnect to that. Plus, I had traveling. Can you hear those dogs? I hope not. When I started, they were the cafe downstairs was playing Lana De Del Rey, and I thought, well, that would be nice background music, but uh, it's off now, so I don't have to worry about a copyright strike anyway from that, I guess. Uh, was I talking about? And planning, uh, planning uh, for my future steps. I'm going to be here about another month in this apartment, this Airbnb in Toronto, uh, in uh, Vlor. I don't even remember what city I'm in. Till July 1st, so all of June. In July, I'm moving to the main city in Albania, Tirania, for three months. I've got a couple different places there, one place for four weeks and one place for uh, eight weeks. And then I'll be going to Spain, but more about that later. So I've spent a couple weeks in Madrid, uh, then down to the Canary Islands. That'll take me through the end of the year. I just explained everything after saying more about that later. Anyway, so I spent a lot of time doing that kind of stuff this week, planning what I want to do. I read a short story by Stephen King, which is available for free download on Kindle in Spanish. The story is called Lori. It's about an old man with a dog. Uh, you know, he's a pretty... King is not my favorite writer anymore. I like a lot of his early books pretty well. I am going to read the new short story collection when it comes out. I've already got it on hold from the library. And I think this story... There's also the English language version is free online too, so... I think it's a fairly recent story. It's from 2018. Uh, an older man gets a, uh, whose, whose wife dies after 40 years, and his sister comes and buys him a puppy, and he doesn't want the puppy, and bonds with the puppy, and then there's some Stephen King-type stuff in it. Um, it's pretty good to try and read in Spanish. I did read it in English. I tried it in Spanish a couple times first, then read it in English to see what I'd missed, which was... Not much. It was pretty clear that one good thing about trying to read Stephen King in a language you barely know is he is a pretty flabby writer. So there's a lot of information repeated that probably would have, in a tighter story would have been cut and uh, makes it easier to read in a foreign language because he keeps repeating information about it's like, are they still talking about how he doesn't want this dog after four pages? Yes, they are. Anyway, so, starting to start on a negative note, I know a lot of people like Stephen King, and I, I like a lot of his stuff a lot, but as the years have gone by, I find more of his stuff to be really kind of bloated. And Anyway, what I read mostly this week was um, still horror mayhem stuff. I didn't read anything else. I thought I was getting sick of it. Of horror, I was going to read some other things, didn't get around to it. I read Fritz Leiber, and I was almost going to do a separate video on these Fritz Leiber works that I read, but I, since I didn't have anything else going on on the week anyway, that would be kind of redundant to do one video on, on Fritz Leiber and one video on my weekly wrap-up, which would be all about Fritz Leiber. So mainly what I read is this book, not a great cover, uh, there's some really cool classic covers of this. This is the ebook cover, Our Lady of Darkness, which is a novel from 1977. Very atmospheric beginning. If you, it's set in San Francisco. It's very much set in San Francisco, like a lot of Fritz Leiber's stuff. He lived there many years, or most of his life, probably. And it's... It's a fantasy horror novel, um, but and it deals with it's kind of an arcane knowledge kind of 
novel where the writer that the main character is a writer, a horror writer. His name is Franz. It's very similar to. He used a lot of autobiographical elements. Fritz Leiber's wife had died very tragically young, and he became an alcoholic. And the similar things happened to to the narrator of this story, to the hero of this story. In fact, I had to put it down a couple times during the week, and I, um, just for various reasons, I wasn't able to get back to it for a day or two. And every time I put it down and got back, I was surprised to be reminded that it's not in first person, it's told in third person. That's how tight it is to Fritz Leiber's uh, life and how close it, it stays to the to the narr to the uh, point of view of the narrator Franz, who's a kind of uh, not the most successful horror writer. Uh, he most of his work is done novelizing some series called Underground Witchcraft, or I can't remember the name. It's, it's very unclear what kind of series it is. Anyway, it's it's basically hack work, but he takes it very seriously. He finds a diary, a journal, um, something like that, uh, written under not written under the name Clark Ashton Smith, but he pretty quickly determines that it was written by Clark Ashton Smith, who is a famous uh, uh, Weird Tales writer, close um, part of the, you know, Lovecraft, Clark Ashton Smith circle, considered besides Howard and Lovecraft, the greatest Weird Tales writer was also a San Francisco writer, and it goes into a lot of history of literary San Francisco, you know, um, Jack London, well, that's Bay Area, um, other writers, cults, it has to do with, uh, they start tracking down this cult, um, very atmospheric, the, the first chapter is wonderful, it reminded me of the first chapter of Passage to India by E.M. Foster, um, where the first chapter is just a description of 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 the of the environs of the city uh and and written from written in a way to like presage or to set up the the atmosphere of the novel i read that first chapter probably four or five times i don't often do that but I read it at least four or five times in Our Lady of Darkness because I just enjoyed the prose so much. So I give that a recommend. The other thing I read was, let's see if I can bring it up here, um, half of his selected stories. This always happens when I do this. I pull it up and then it goes to the next page. Fritz Leiber's selected stories, selected by Strahan and Charles N. Brown, who's the editor of Locust Magazine, passed away a few years ago. Uh, introduction by Neil Gaiman, which you can skip. Because um, it's all about Neil Gaiman and what Neil Gaiman thinks. Which is, not, I guess, if you're a Neil Gaiman fan, that's good. Anyway, uh, Jonathan Strahan's a, a well-known contemporary horror writer, so they pick great stories. What I like about this anthology is they're mostly in chronological order. It has, see if I can bring up the, it has a couple of the Fafford and Gray Mauser stories. If you don't know Fritz Leiber's work, he had several different modes of writing. He wrote horror novels such as Conjure Wife, which is made into a movie called Burn Witch Burn, and and he wrote a lot of horror, uh, science fiction novels, which some are good and some are bad, I think is the conventional wisdom. I think the first book I read by him was The Wanderer, which is a science fiction novel, which I didn't like at all. But he also wrote Sword and Sorcery. He had this pair of uh, two thieves, Fafford and the Grey Mauser, who, who live around this ancient, you know, prehistorical city called... Lankmar, which is also very obviously based on San Francisco, and, and those stories are fantastic. I think I might reread re them again during Conan month, even though I should be reading Conan, I guess. But they're just so good. Yeah, one thing I do agree with Neil Gaiman with about what is like when you read Fafford and, and Grey Mouser, it just takes kind of the sword and sorcery genre to a more lively, 
level. I'm sure not everybody agrees with this, but I am one of those that thinks they're better than the Conan stories. Although, you know, it's a pretty good argument that there would never be a Fafford and Great Mazar without Conan. But those stories are terrific. There's a couple of those in here, um, including the story where they meet, called Ilmet and Lankmar. Let's see if I can find the the table of contents in this in this file. Oh, maybe it's better on this. Uh, so, like I said, I've only halfway through it all. Those some of the stories I'd read before anyway. Um, this is the copyrights page. Page. The first two stories are horror stories, and for the prompt of. The third week prompt for uh, Horror Mayhem was to read classic horror. And for that, I am counting the second story in this collection, The Girl with the Hungry Eyes. The Girl with the Hungry Eyes, fantastic story, very vivid, very gripping, grippingly written, very misogynistic in its tone. Uh, that's the voice of the narrator, however. Uh, you can see, I think it's a very realistic narrator of a person from the point of view of a Fashion photographer, not fashion photographer, advertising photographer uh, who uses female models in his advertising copy in a, in a small market, uh, not in New York. Uh, it was written in, it was published in 49. And I meant to talk about the earlier story first, Smoke Ghost. But since I've already started talking about the girl with the hungry eyes, uh, that title might be familiar to you. It's been used many times. The story originally appeared in a Donald Walheim collection of four or five novellas, I think. Uh, this is this is pretty long, probably around, it's probably a novel at length, The Girl with the Hungry Eyes and other stories edited by Donald Walheim in 1949. It's pretty clear why that title was chosen as the t name of the collection, because it's so evocative. Um, it's one of his most evocative titles, and he had some pretty good titles overall. It's kind of an update of the type of ghost story I've talked about a lot here. You know, the, the, the sort of conventional setup of a 18th or a 19th century ghost story where you've got a, a bunch of gentlemen sitting around in a club and they start telling stories to each other or one tells a story. That's what happens here more or less. It's it's uh, very tightly on this guy's point of view, which is some modern readers might just find it just too noxious because of his attitude, the, the, uh, the character's attitudes towards women, um, which might reflect on, on some level Fritz Leiber's attitudes, if you read over a lot of his books, he had some issues with women that he probably never completely worked out. You know, the book Conjure Wife, the, uh, it's about a guy whose wife is a witch, it's kind of like a serious version of, of Bewitched, I guess, and, you know, except in the book, you find out that, that all women are, are witches. Anyway, um, so it's this guy, he's telling his story in in a bar. You don't really picture the, you don't, you don't see the, the uh, environs aren't described or anything. It's just like his monologue, you know, he's ordering whiskey. He's obviously an alcoholic, as many Fritz Leiber characters are, uh, either a, a, a former alcoholic or a current alcoholic. This one's a, a current alcoholic telling this story which has a lot to do with, it's very contemporary in the sense that I'm counting as classic horror because it is an acknowledged classic, but it's very contemporary in its themes. It's about the advertising industry, and this is why it's such a good update of that kind of old convention of, I've got a ghost story for you, you gentlemen. And, you know, it's clearly for an all-male audience. In fact, when I read it, I thought, I wonder if you tried to publish this in Playboy or something, but actually Playboy wasn't even... Uh, be published at that point. Not quite, I guess. I looked it up. I guess it came out in the 50s, but there was a lot of fiction 
a lot of science fiction writers uh, published early stories in Playboy. You can see how they kind of geared it towards an all-male audience. Like there's a famous story by Frederick Pohl called Day Million. Um, and it's really written in uh, of an author addressing like the ideal Playboy reader, which would be a guy who's like, uh, you know, likes the right scotch and, 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 uh, you know, has really good, uh, stereo equipment and all kinds of, you know, stuff that you could picture like the sort of man who reads Playboy kind of thing. And this prob this story is probably directed at a similar audience because it, it talks about the, 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 I, the advertising industry and the power of advertising and, and it's a story about that. So I would recommend it highly unless you just can't stand the idea of just the noxious uh, narrator. Um, he also, the first story in this collection is called Smoke Ghost. Smoke Ghost. <clears throat> I'm trying to enunciate better because when I listen back to these, I'm like, oh my God, how can anybody understand what I'm saying? I'll take a breath. Smoke Ghost was published in Unknown Worlds, which was an excellent pulp magazine. Uh, trying to do elevated, you know, I can't believe I used that word, trying to do more sophisticated fantasy and horror than they found in the pulps. They actually switched from a pulp, pulp cover early on to like a sort of more literary co cover, meaning they would just list the stories on the, on the front and the authors trying to go for a different audience. So many of the best, much of the best writing of, of in horror and fantasy that didn't appear in Weird Tales appeared in Unknown Worlds. I don't know what phase the magazine was in when this story was published in October 1941. So you got Smoke Ghost, which is the early story in this collection, published in 1941. And The Girl with the Hungry Eyes, published in... 1949. No, oh, I forgot all that stuff about the title of Girl with Hungry Eyes. So the reason the title might be familiar other than just the story is it was the title of this paperback, which uh, then became a title that was used in like a giallo film in the 60s, uh, not adapted from the story, just ripped off from the story more or less. It's seems unlikely to be a coincidence but probably just saw the paper probably the filmmaker or the or the screenwriter or just saw the paperback someplace thought that'd be a cool idea uh, name for a movie and then um there's a, a pop song in the 80s who do, uh, yay, yay, yay. oh it's a jefferson starship song from uh 79 so I'm guessing it was probably stolen from either just the paperback or, or inspired by just either the paperback, somebody seeing the paperback in, or, or more likely the movie. Then there is an actual adaption of the, of the movie. I'm looking at the disambiguation page for Girl with Hungry Eyes. There was an actual adaption of the story in the 90s. It just, I haven't seen it, it just from the, from the poster just looks terrible just looks like how did i end up with the wikipedia about page uh 1990 film about, directed by john jacobs uh based on the song and so oh and there also was a night gallery adaption adaptation of the song adaption of the song what do you say adaptation or adapted i think you say adaptation night gallery in 72 adapted the actual story which is probably better than the 95 movie, just guessing. So that's why this title might seem familiar, but I recommend finding the story if you can. That collection, this library collection that I mentioned, uh, if you have selected stories, uh, it is in the Kindle, what's the thing called? The, the Kindle, um, the subscription where you can read as many books uh, a month, uh, Kindle Unlimited. It's in that. Also, if you, I checked on the sample, 
if you download, if you don't have Kindle Unlimited, but you want to try uh, Fritz Library, you can download that anthology and and the sample has the first two stories, uh, which is The Girl with the Hungry Eyes and uh, Smoke Ghost Complete. And that will probably be enough to, for you to decide if you want to read more Fritz Leiber, and I hope you do. Anyway, so the first story, so these stories kind of make a nice pair because they're written on either side of World War II. The 1941 story, Smoke Ghost, I would say... See, Leiber was already in his 30s by the time... Oh, man, I hope I didn't break my Kindle. I've broken, this is the first e-reader I've ever owned that I haven't broken yet, so. No, it's still working. Um, I sat on a Kobo device once when they had, when Kobo had its own devices. And I, I stepped on a Kindle once, and I, and the third one, I guess I didn't break the third one, I just got old. <clears throat> this is the fourth one I've owned. Anyway, um, the Girl with the Hungry Eyes, written eight years later, is shows much better control of of narrative structure. I guess would be the way to put it. The, the first one, Smoke Ghost. I think people still enjoy the story. It's a bit clumsier in its setup. Is the only quibble I can find just to, to make it sound like I'm not like a cheerleader of everything I read. Um, where it starts, it's it's sort of a conversation in a in an office where this from the point of view of the secretary who's portrayed as being a bit dim and shallow and she's actually more of a cliche. She's more of a misogynistically written character than than anything in The Girl with the Hungry Eyes, uh, just because she's kind of a cliche of a stupid sort of, she's sort of, it's, she's written as kind of a thing, as kind of like a madman era secretary, meaning not how the women are written in mag, madman, but how the men characters in mag, madman like to think, like to imagine their secretaries are, are like, sort of that thing. And she's kind of written to be just kind of a cliche character. Then after, you know, they ramble on for a while, then it goes to, then he goes to a psychiatrist and, and tells his psychiatrist more of his theories. So, uh, so uh, it's just kind of a clumsy way to get all the information out there of this whole guy's story, but just having him sort of randomly talk to a couple people that are, however, in the third section, he goes back to work and the story really, really takes off then. I mean, it's not like the first sections are bad. They do give you the information you need, but it's just not as masterful as anything else I've read by by Liber. So it's interesting to see his growth as a writer over that, that war period, over the 40s. Um, Smoke Ghost is also in the collection The Weird, which I know, which I mentioned because some people, I know a lot of people own that collection on ebook, especially. It's a humongous collection edited by Anne and Jeff Vandermeer. So Smoke Ghost is the, in there. I don't know why they chose that instead of The Girl with Hungry Eyes. Well, I have an idea. Probably uh, it seems more acceptable to a modern audience because of. The more neutral voice and and the let and the as opposed to the the noxious air, uh, narrator of Girl with Hungry Eyes. Then I read. Then I'm about halfway through the collection, uh, but those two you can read just by downloading the sample. Um, he there's another story in here I like. Uh, like I say, it's got these early Fafford and Gray Mauser stories, which were fun to read again out of out of out of order, the, uh, the others I'd read are in the collection. It's nice to just read one at a time because all, almost all the Pfaffer and Gray Mauser books, I think there's one that's a novel, but most of them are collections of four or five long stories. And they're great to read that way too, but it's just fun to just read one and really focus on it. He wrote a story in here called Four Ghosts in Hamlet, which was a fun read. It's a, little, a bit lighter in tone. It's actually pretty charming. 
uh, story, if you like, uh, light. Uh, again, Four Ghosts and Hamlet, if you like, would like to read like a lighter ghost story, um, a more charming kind of ghost story and not a, a horrifying one where terrible things happen to everybody. Um, that would be a good pick. Uh, the reason I mention it is it's it's in the world of theater, which Fritz Leiber knew well because his father was a, a well-known actor. I almost said famous actor. I wouldn't go that far. He was a he was a well-known, very accomplished stage actor, Shakespearean actor, who had a lot of parts in Hollywood movies, especially in the '40s. He's in um, the movie. Well, the movie comes to mind for me is Seahawk with uh, Errol Flynn. He's in that. He looks so much, they father and son look so much alike, it's uncanny. Um, so sometimes you'll see movies. In fact, first time I think I saw the title, I thought, oh my God, he was, because I knew Fritz Leiber Jr. was also an actor for a while, but uh, didn't have the same success as his father. But uh, So he knows that world of theater, and it's always good when a, uh, when a writer has a good background in the the milieu they're they're writing about, it just brings that much more energy to it. And as I've said many times on this channel, I, I like books about theater and I like reading about uh, the theater and backstage theater stuff. Which brings to me me to my did not finish for the week, which and I was very disappointed about this. It was Judy Dench's book. What is her book called? I think it's called The Man Who Pays the Rent. And I, it was it's marketed as a book. And I had it on my library hold list for a long time. Been waiting for it to come out. And so it came in. It's marketed as uh, her book about Shakespeare and her relationship to Shakespeare. And and playing Shakespeare and how to play it and all this sounded like a really good top level book. What it is, is that it's a collection of very superficial interviews she did with a friend of hers where the friend was like, oh, these are pretty good. You know, he started recording her, at, you know, just kind of for posterity's sake. And uh, her grandson heard them laughing and that's what they were talking about. So he decided this, this would make a great book, but the way they did it, it's just these, it's just these sort of offhand conversations. And if I'd known that going in, I might have been more interested in it. But she doesn't really have a lot to say about the first couple plays that that I read. So it's just kind of like unfocused chatting conversations. Really could have been edited more. It's basically just transcripts, which are are fine. Uh, you know, I'd probably watch a few of those on. YouTube, if you know, like you see, there's like sometimes these history of television clips where, where Michelle Nichols talks about the first generation on, on television with William Shatner in Star Trek, you know, talks about that day on the set and everything, or you know, or Ron Howard talks about being Opie, you know, those kind of things. It's just kind of that level. Um, but I, I wanted something more, so. Since I wasn't going to enjoy it for what it was, I stopped reading it. Uh, that's basically what I have for the week. I'm not going to go... I'm not going to do any of the bingo card. I've got it up here on my screen, but didn't really add much to the bingo card because I was overly aggressive on the, on the categories before. But there's one called... There is... Is there cult horror? I always think there's cult horror, but there isn't. Extreme horror. There's really no extreme horror this time. Mm -hmm. Next week's prompt is. Oh, so where am I at on the hundred story challenge? I'm at thirty four books now because I read uh, Our Lady of Darkness and, and Fritz Leiber's stories. And so I've done 34 out of my 100 book challenge. Not very far compared to previous weeks, but that's okay. I, I'll still get done. I thought I was just going to read just tons and tons of cheesy horror this month, but I ended up wanting to read like a little more substantial books afterwards. This coming week, the prompt for horror mayhem is following up on week three, which was classic horror. And I'm counting the girl with the hungry, hungry eyes for that.
I wanted to say more about Our Lady of Darkness. You know, it's really 70s, uh, but uh, which is cool. It's about changes in, in C um, Seattle, in San Francisco in the 70s. You know, there's big bit about uh, big descriptions of the TV tower, which you can equate to having cell phone towers going up around you in modern times. But it did feel like, and it felt more like a classic, even though it's from, it's like sort of the dirty, hairy, Zodiac killer era of San Francisco that's being evoked there, even though it's a bit later than those. Dirty Air came out in 71, Zodiac Killer was active, uh, you know, starting in the late 60s until 1970. But it is that kind of feel. <coughs> Excuse me. So I decided I couldn't use this classic horror, even though it is a classic. So instead, I'm counting the girl with hungry eyes from the '40s as classic. And along those lines, for this final prompt, the fourth week prompt, and I read the introduction of this book this morning. And I'm gonna. The reason I decided to make this video now is so I can go back and read the book because I have a feeling I could be wrong. I have a feeling it's going to be a one sitting read. And the prompt is contemporary horror, modern horror, and I'm, uh, I'm sure a lot of people wouldn't consider this modern now, but my argument is that this book and its direct sequel did, did sort of bring about or were like uh, emblematic of a, of a big change in the way bestsellers were written and the way thrillers were written and the book is Manhunter, Hunt, Man Hunter, the first Hannibal Lecter novel by Thomas Harris. And I'm going to read uh, Silence of the Lambs after that. I've never read these books. I've seen all the movies, even the terrible ones of Hannibal Lecter. Actually, I don't think I saw the, the prequel. And I watched the all the episodes of the... Uh, television series which I, people like as and has some good things in it has some ridiculous things in it too but you know the whole story the whole Hannibal Lecter uh, history is ridiculous so and it gets more ridiculous as it goes so I know these stories which is probably why I've never really gotten around to reading them but Already I can tell this story is really written in a, in a way that the modern best, it kind of really, especially Sansa Lambs, but this one too, it sort of set the mold for how uh, bestsellers or, or, or horror at this level is written, you know, it's like really a lot uh more violent and more violent imagery and more extreme um, with really short, punchy chapters. and So I feel like something changed in, in the 80s with horror uh, and I think most people really consider Hannibal Lecter novels horror now. At the time, I think they didn't really want to market it that way because they wanted, you know, because horror had a worse reputation than it does now. Um, you know, it came out in 81. I can't believe it was that long ago. So this is like barely into Stephen King's career. And they're, you know, they're... So it spawned not only the the serial killer, the, the pop bestseller serial killer category, the FBI profiler category, and how many billions of TV shows about profilers are there, you know, because mostly because of Clary Starling and, you know, the big elements of, of uh, connections with, um, you know, influ influ influential, um, powerful people, the corridor of power, so it goes all the way uh, from from people like, say, say un un unlike a... a a Stephen King novel, you know, where it's like focused on a family like The Shining or a small town like, like 
Salem's Lot or Cary, you know, high school in a small town and Cary and all these about ordinary people. This one has to do, like, I, I remember that the victim that they're trying to save in Silence of the Lambs is a senator's daughter. So it's got that extra level of sort of pseudo-political thriller on it where these things start to matter because they touch the people in power. And so it has a lot of those elements in it that I would consider more modern, even though I guess, you know, I'm, I'm straining the, the definition of contemporary by picking a 40 year old book. Anyway, I feel like something changed. I feel like there's a, de there's a seat of de demarcation from the Thomas Hare type of big, big fat, uh, serial killer thriller horror thriller as opposed to um, some of the works that came before which i would consider classic that's what i'm doing this week i have uh, picked out books for june on the range i've picked out books for the sporting life or it's not called that it's called the summer of sport i think i've got some for that i've got some star trek books I thought I had one on my Kindle, turns out I have two, plus I have a book that I can use for one of the nonfiction prompts, which I think is a really good pick. I'm not going to talk about any of those now. I'm going to do a buddy read with a buddy of mine. Um, and, well, I guess I'll wait to talk about that since it's not June yet for June on the Range. And then there's, um, so there's what's coming up, Star Trek, Sport, Westerns, I've got a bunch of Westerns to read. I've got like seven Brian Garfield Westerns. I know he's not the most famous Western writer, but I just happen to have seven of his books that I got in some deal a long time ago. Um, he, Brian Garfield's most famous is the writer of Death Wish and a lot of thrill, although the book is very much different than, than the movie from what I understand. and But he also wrote a bunch of Westerns. Probably the most famous title, and the one I'll probably start with after I do my buddy read um, with Faceless Book Reviews, we're going to do a buddy read. We picked out a book, but I'll, I'll leave the title. After I read that, I'll probably read by Brian Garfield. I'll probably read The Last Hard Men, which is probably the most, of, of the ones that he... Um, the ones I have, there's another one called, title called The, Unv the Unvanquished. Um, so those might be the most well-known ones. I don't know. I'll see how far I get with them. It might be like this month when I tried to do Ray Garten. And <clears throat> I read one pair, you know, I have like 10 of those. Ray Garten, uh, gross slasher type extreme horror novels. I read like one sentence of one of them and decided I don't really want to read these. So it could be the same thing with uh, Brian Garden, but I've got at least um, two other Westerns, actually more than that, that I can read. So I'll be doing some Westerns. Hopefully I'll knock off some stuff. I don't have any Louis L'Amour on my Kindle, unfortunately. So, and there's nothing on Project Gutenberg by him, so I can't buy any, so I won't be doing that prompt. Anyway, that's my week past, which I managed to get a lot of uh, blabbing on about uh, one and a half books, one novel and half the story collection of Fritz Leiber, a little complaining about Stephen King, and some blabbing about what I'm going to read in the future. So I'll leave it there.